Tomb Raider 2 starts centuries ago, where a great battle is being fought between Chinese warriors and Chinese warrior monks. Like all ancient battles, this one had its beast. No Nazgul or giant polar bear here, just your run-of-the-mill dragon. Realising that probably the quickest way into the arms of death was by annoying the dragon, an injured soldier steals its magical pacemaker and is immediately char-grilled. After the battle, two more soldiers take this pacemaker, or a dagger, deep beneath the Great Wall of China, where they discover its true power. The power they locked away from the world for another 600 years. Yes, the power of the laser disco. In 1997, Lara Croft returned to us and promptly threw herself out of a helicopter, coincidentally landing metres away from a cave those ancient warrior monks just entered a few hundred years previously. Making her way past the gauntlet of traps and some tigers who had presumably survived generations of inbreeding by eating spiders and crows and a happily married couple of Tyrannosaurus rexes, Lara arrives at the gateway to the Temple of Jeanne. Here, she's attacked by a stereotype who reveals that Lara isn't the only one after a treasure behind the door. So is an Italian called Marco Bartoli. Scared of revealing more information, the goon swallows some poison and croaks it. <coughs> Which is a bit extreme when he could have just, you know, not told her anything else. Lara realises she doesn't have the door handled to the temple, and so she can't go any further since she doesn't decide to start kicking doors in for another two games. Luckily the Italian had discovered an ancient Wi-Fi hotspot in the cave, and that led Lara into Venice to search for more clues. Lara teleports herself into an alleyway, then makes her way to the canal where she steals a motorboat. Because everyone knows motorboats are fast and explosive, now Lara makes great use of one of her boats, not by driving safely around the watery streets of Venice, but by driving via a time door, because we all know Italians love to live life in the fast lane, or something, and into a minefield. <laughs> It's all good though, because rather conveniently it leads her into Marco Bartoli's hideout. Unfortunately he's nowhere around, for he's left lots of tough Italian men with massive tools to deal with Lara. Why use assault rifles from a distance when you can brain a pretty lady with a monkey wrench up close and personal like? Since he's gone AWOL, Lara uses her brain. What do all good mafia crime lords do in their spare time? Kick back and relax at an opera, of course. Marco's locals seemed a bit worse for wear, however, and after avoiding a few more gun-toting suits and ducking some falling hazards, Lara stumbles through backstage and finds Bartoli's secret hangar bay. She climbs on board as a stowaway and finds a really, really good hiding place in with all the luggage. Brilliant, no one's ever gonna look in there, especially not another one of those tool-wielding muscle men. Okay, so let's admit it, she can raid tombs, but she's not too bright when it comes to finding good hiding places. Lara wakes up unarmed sometime later and realises she's actually on an oil rig of all places, and suspiciously enough all the employees seem to be Italian, and carrying guns, and trying to kill her. They also seem to have a deep attachment for the aforementioned Italian love of making life as hard as possible for themselves. I mean, come on, why put a switch that opens a door next to the door that you're trying to open when you can put it 17 miles away underwater and at the end of a stupidly convoluted series of traps? Genius. A few months of gameplay later, Lara stumbles across poor old Brother Chen of Barkang Monastery being frisked by some of the Fiamma Nera cult. Irritated that they prefer a wrinkly monk to her own nubile self, Lara does what any self-respecting girl should do. She shoots them. Having disposed of the cultists, Lara strips in exchange for some information from this celibate monk, and really rubs his nose in the fact that he can't have his wicked way with her, and not just because Buddha says no, by throwing a shoe at him. Lucky for Lara, Mr. Monk had already divulged his greatest secret, that he and his brothers guard the doorknob to the Temple of Jeanne, otherwise known as the Talion. But the Talion is safely locked away beneath their monastery, and only the Seraph can open the lock to the catacombs that conceal it. The Seraph is an ornate key that sank to the bottom of the ocean when it was on the set of the movie Titanic 2 Attack of the Maria Doria. Catching a lift on the underwater minibus service, Lara displays exactly why she has such impressive assets. It's where she stores her superhuman lung capacity. She swims down to the depths of the ocean where she miraculously avoids being eaten by some hammer-headed sharks and finds the entrance to the sunken cruise liner, the Maria Doria. After thinning out the members list of the Fiamma Nera, Lara finds the Seraph locked in a storage room on the ship's deck. Shortly afterwards, she lures Ariel to her side and blags a quick ride to the surface by promising the Little Mermaid that she can introduce her to some nice Italians who will make her a real woman. She lied, of course, and Cor cut this scene because it was totally stupid. At this point, Lara felt her hands were too clean and so engaged in some Grand Theft Auto by stealing a plane. 
She also steals herself a nice new woolly coat, because a woolly jacket is all a girl needs in sub-zero temperatures. Just as well, really, because the plane runs out of fuel and plunges into the Tibetan mountainside, not unlike the crash she experienced when she was 21 and not 9 years old. Everyone knows driving is much more exciting than walking, so Lara takes control of a snow bike and razzes it across the snowscape, mowing down many an Italian in her path. Because you know, driving around cultists is almost as bad as condoning their cultish behaviour. And she falls into a lot of icy pits, because let's face it, those snowmobiles handle like a cross between a Tesco shopping trolley and a tractor. When Lara arrives at Barkang Monastery, she finds the front doors closed, and a great battle raging outside between the Shaolin and the plumbers with attitude. They want to clean the drains, but the monks insisted that they had someone round the previous week to clean them out. The plumbers kept pushing it though, Shut up your face! and earned themselves a good holy ass kicking. Having not seen a woman in 500 years, the monks decide not to hurt our eponymous heroine, and instead watch her intensely as she loots, pillages, and generally scams them out of everything they hold dear, probably mesmerised by Lara's obvious feminine charm. A few weeks later, Lara has cut out all the coupons in the local newspaper and sent off for a free five prayer wheels, which she donates to the monastery, and then uses the seraph to unlock the doors to the catacombs. The catacombs were home to the terrifying yetis, don't be fooled, these guys aren't annoyed because they're cold all the time, they're the embodiment of evil. The embodiment of furry, roaring, screeching, hairy evil. If you ever encounter one of these creatures, you mustn't think about what an amazing discovery it is, you must empty a magazine of lead into its skull, mainly because if you don't, they will drive their fists into yours. Guarding the Talion is a giant metallic bird. Again, it's a great scientific discovery, but Lara's hobby of knocking creatures off the endangered species list and onto the extinct list is more important. So with the doorknob firmly in her grasp, she steals a jeep and kills Morphia Manera, with the cult leader Marco Bartoli hot on her tail. Back at the Great Wall of China, she retraces her steps to the doorway of the temple and inserts the doorknob. Thinking about it, she could have just used a stick or a tin of beans or something that same shape, even some TNT or a grenade but then I guess that would have eradicated the need to travel across the globe for small and nearly pointless objects like doorknobs. Dang! It seems the ancients had mastered the art of slapstick comedy and had placed an old trapdoor right in front of the dagger of Jeanne, the artifact that if plunged into your heart will turn you into a dragon. Also the legend goes, and now you know what the dragon at the start was all about. It also seemed that on her travels Lara had become the messiah and picked up the ability to slide over the surface of water. In the belly of the temple, Lara works her way through trap-filled chambers, up through Shelob's lair and back to the dagger chamber, where she witnesses the cult leader, Marco Bartoli, taking steps to ensure he never has to listen to his nagging wife ever again. He plunges the dagger into his heart, and his loyal servants carry him off to the land of fairies and elves and make-believe, or possibly Essex, I don't know. Lara pops a couple of magic mushrooms and follows them through the psychotropic gateway on a journey to the soul. Once she's completely tripping, Lara watches her hands for a bit, finds some new friends in the form of clanking monster men, and discovers the world's biggest floating jade mine, before witnessing the corpse of an Italian crime lord transform into a gargantuan serpentine fire-breathing beast. After avoiding a good roasting, Lara does what she does best, and steals the ancient artifact right out of his heart. Yoink! For her, it was like taking candy from a baby. Granted, a hundred foot long baby with a flamethrower anyway. Lara's hallucination reaches such a level that the dragon melts and the temple crumbles, so she escapes via an exploding passageway. Of course, there's plenty more Italians in the sea, as the old saying goes, and late one night, as Lara was about to do something with the dagger of Jeanne, she's mobbed by the remaining cultists. Preferring not to get the police involved, Lara takes the sensible route once more, finds a handy shotgun, and finally adds the Fiamma Nera to that list of extinct species. <laughs> Here endeth Lara's second outing.